I'm going to tell you just a little bit about you know, the science background behind what we're doing, and then show you what we're trying to accomplish with this on EG research protocols. Um, I'm a neurophysiologist. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. That's, that's my background. Um, I spent uh, several years at the National Institute of Health. I have a double affiliation there with the National Institute of Mental Health and the National Institute of Deafness and Other Communication Disorders. Um, and then, after six years there, I spent another five years at the Salk Institute um, as a neurophysiology researcher. <clears throat> You've been hearing a lot about interception and monitoring the body interstates, and that's a lot of the work done at Lieber uh, by Justin Feinstein, Sahib, and a lot of our colleagues. My background is on conceptual representation and evolution of language, and uh, sort of a fancy way to say that I care about how we make sense of the world, right? How we categorize different things that we know that, you know, chairs and tables are pieces of furniture, or, you know, uh, sardines and pineapples are fruit, and how does the brain instantiate those things? How do we, you know, have that represented in the brain? So I spent several years um, with Alex Martin, amongst other people, uh, looking at, you know, how does this process occur? And what we know is, unlike many other things, uh, and, and what was thought before, and that there's like a specific area that just, you know, has this nice package of memories and representation of what we have, what we really find out is that what we call embodied cognition. There's a neural network that spreads the different features um, of what you're experiencing, and then it gets stored within that same network. So, for instance, you've been hearing about different um, insula, uh, middle frontal cortex, etc., different brain areas. Think about, in this case, in you know, different sensory areas, like visual cortex, auditory, somatosensory, and basically all these areas get active when you're experiencing something. So, for instance, when you see a dog, let's say, right, you're going to have visual cortex being active about the visual features of the dog, the color, the shape, you know, four legs, what it looks like. You're going to have somatosensory if you touch the dog and feel the fur, um, auditory if you hear the dog bark, etc. So there's, the idea is there's a neural network distributed and different brain areas working together and the representation of the memory sort of emerges from this. Um, so we did a lot of work on this. Uh, we used techniques like the ones we've been seeing, fMRI and PET, so those big brain imaging where you have the nice brain with the blobs of colors that tells you where each thing is happening or which brain areas are involved. We did a lot of work on that, but for the purpose of this presentation, we're actually going to talk more about EG, so electroencephalography. Um, after these years um, at the NIH and then at the SALC, and working, you know, just like just with fMRI and PET, one of the advantages of the EG is that it gives you a better temporal resolution. So when you look at those, what we call T-maps, those brain activation maps that, you know, Sahib, Justin, Colleen has been showing you, you're basically looking where different things are happening in the brain. But then the key is, the temporal resolution, how does each one of these areas actually, you know, plays a role in this thing. And EEG or electroencephalography can help you with the temporal resolution for that and give you the snapshot of most interesting events will occur below a second, 100, 300, 500, 600 milliseconds. So we really want to have a different technique for that. This is the traditional um, EEG gear setup. So let's see, there you go. So, this is the usual cap, each one of those things is, is an electrode, is a sensor. So these are passive sensors. Um, we usually gel them to get better conductance. Um, and then it's connected, you have a bunch of wires, it's connected to amplifiers, because it's a very, very, you know, microvolt level of signal. Uh, and we basically get all these gear up to measure electrical currents going through your skull. What's happening is your neurons are fired, so your brain cells are firing, they create electrical charges. When different brain areas um, have electrons firing together, you're going to have these waves of activity that just you know, go through your skull. And that's basically what we're measuring here and what people have been working on for many, many years. So what are the kind of things of brain signals that we can, um, we can engage with it? There's definitely a, a vast variety of things, but the two main aspects is what we call event-related potentials. Um, and basically, this looks something like this. Um, this is two types of brain waves. And here the idea is you're going to stimulate the brain, let's say, with images or sounds. Um, and that's going to be sort of your time zero. And then you see how the brain responds to those images. So you could have, for instance, an attention test where you're going to ask people to, you know, pay attention to a certain target image for a while. And then you're going to have other images that are distractors. This is an example of such a thing. Spikes that you see like this one or this one are different brain event-related potentials, which is basically your brain discriminating, in this case, between target images versus distractors images, and what this allows you to do is having a measure of, you know, the neural response to attention. 
So for instance, if these um, differences are smaller, typically is associated with a worse performance on the section. Okay? I'm not going to spend too much time with it, but I thought it was important that you guys get a bit of a background of the kind of, of things that we can see here. The other one is frequency analysis, and I'm going to focus on this quite a bit. Um, while this one is associated in time lock to a specific event, and basically what we do is we replicate that event many times, average it, to then get this kind of wave. This is more about continuous monitoring. You can also associate with different events, but the idea here is you're picking all of these signals, so basically all the electricity that you have in one of these brain waves, and you're breaking it down by frequencies, okay? From lower frequencies, like here, to higher. So you have things like, and you know, on the floats, you keep hearing the theta state, right? So that comes from increased activity within this frequency band, which is theta. This is alpha, beta, and gamma. And basically what it means is, when all these you know, different brain areas on the network are firing, what you're going to have is each aspect of that network is going to contribute at a different frequency. So you have a lot of work done on the past 50, 60 years, um, in some cases more, both on frequency analysis on ERPs, and really understanding how these neural measures correlate to behavior, to things like attention, memory, you know, all sorts of, of cognitive performance. So when you look at a graph like this, uh, and we're going to show you quite a bit of those, Basically what you have is, this is time, so it's going to start scrolling and basically it's a pass of the time. And here you get the different frequency bands, we sort of uh, line it up for you, uh, and go from low frequency to high frequency. So this is usually sometimes between, you know, 4 to 7 hertz, 7 to 14, uh, about 15 to 25, 30, and this is about 30. And of course, you know, it's hertz, right? so it means like how many times a cycle per second. Um, so you have lower frequency bands, low speed, and high frequency bands. I know this is not too exciting, but we'll get exciting in a minute. Um, so, after you know, being doing research for several years at different institutes at National Institute of Health, one of the things that I started feeling that you know, was less satisfying, even though I'm still very interested in fundamental research, but was how much of those applications are coming true, right? So a lot of those brain signals, they've been known for, you know, depending on which one, 50, 30, 20 years. Uh, we know that <laughs> One specific ERP, for instance, like mismatched negativity, it's you know, reduced in schizophrenia patients, in Alzheimer's patients, Parkinson's. Um, we know a lot of these things, but it's in a contained, restricted environment on a clinical setting. Because as you guys saw, there's this big EG machine connected to a bunch of amplifiers that's connected to computers. You need technical stuff um, to, um, yeah, and people to really you know, run and record. Then you need to do all of the analysis afterwards. So it's not something that could really scale. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, we got to the point where we want to, you know, more than see papers being written and put on drawers. We really want to see something, you know, moving on and be translated to society. So that drove me and a few colleagues to um, found Neuroverse. And, and what we did is basically moving some of the things that we have discovered and, uh, and created at the Salk Institute and at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, and to try to really reach you know, somewhere beyond these bottlenecks on EG and have something that will be you know, applicable for everyday life. So we sort of developed um, a couple of things. Uh, one of them was a different EG device. You guys have seen little bits of it. So it's what we call the brain station. Um, in essence, it's a full EG system with an amplifier. It works wirelessly and connects to a smartphone or an iPad app. Um, using low energy Bluetooth, uh, we have different types of sensors. Um, either the traditional rigid sensors like some of you guys probably seen before. We also use this technology called Flex Electronics um, that allows us to really print this pretty much hair thin type of electrodes. We base them on a tegadorm adhesive and that's what we're using in some of this old research. So again, I won't bother too much of the details, but this is important. The other part of it is we have a suite of applications, uh, one of them being Brain Vitals, like I said, runs on smartphones or iPads. And what it does is provides either stimulation or recording control over your device and whatever you want to do with it. So really for us, it's sort of the whole technology that, that we created is built on three things. Okay? So the brain interface device, the brain station, the suite of mobile apps, and then very importantly is this brain analytics database on the server. So a lot of our work is data analysis. So everything from, you know, if you're thinking about these event-related potential, these ERPs, how you provide the simulation is key. Uh, we need to have synchronies below 10 milliseconds from the time that your iPhone or your iPad is showing an image or a sound, and how we put that timestamp on your EG signal. Um, but also, the other aspect of it is how you analyze the data. 
how do you, you know, tease apart muscle signals for all kind of other artifacts you might be picking up on? How do you really, you know, understand different cognitive aspects? So all of that comes from very different analysis procedures and algorithms that we try to, um, to understand and, and to perfect. Um, one of the great things for us on this, and we've been exploring different verticals, is really getting to know more on the scale of a population-based kind of approach how these things work. Ultimately, for us, the whole endeavor of Neuroverse is sort of creating this idea of a multipurpose platform when you can really create your brain interface for everyday life. So we have applications on health, of course, and, and, and this float is an extension of that. Um, projects going on with Parkinson's, uh, with schizophrenia, with migraine, um, different sort of stuff down here. Okay. Different One second. Uh, on institutions and medical centers. On the other side of things, we have this consumer electronics vertical, which sort of came afterwards, uh, where we're really looking into things like you know gaming, entertainment, different aspects of it. And the thing that's really interesting for us is it really allows us to get into a much broader population in terms of data collection, then then feeds back into the health, right? The health is going to give you very specific clinical groups and patient groups that we know are going to have some kind of modifications that we want to understand better, but it's going to be a smaller sample size. If you really want to be able to create brain signals and brain measures that can effectively translate into you know, many applications in society and hopefully really help us understand neuropsychiatric disorders and neurological disorders that are really ramping up in society, especially the increase of longevity, you really need to have a large-scale population sample size. And it's not exactly like people are going to do it just for the sake of doing it. You need to provide some value for them to do it. So that's the aspect of the entertainment side of things. Really helps us, you know, reaching this broader level of consumer electronics, getting the data to help us understand better uh, what we're doing with it. So this is sort of my background pitch. Um, we did as many things that we're doing. One that I think is more interesting, specifically relevant for this, um, is something we're doing with surfing. And this was actually done um, in collaboration with Justin as well. And again, if you want to have your brain interface for everyday life. Uh, you need to be able to do something more than that that someone sitting on a chair, right? Um, if you want to do different activities and different things. Um, this is a project that we're particularly happy about, not just because, you know, it's our system being tested and going over on, you know, a hostile environment, so to speak, and something quite radical in many ways, um, but, you know, we were listening yesterday to um, different talks and different concerns of our veterans on PTSD, so Camp Pendleton actually has an entire program, and it's not the only one in the country, Australia is doing it as well, using surf as you know, a therapy for PTSD uh, patients. And part of the idea that, you know, I thought this was very interesting, and Justin did as well, and worked on this together, is how does that connect to this idea of the float? Because the one thing that is common between the two things is people relate about this as this idea of, you know, getting in the zone, getting in the flow, being very focused about something, being able to sort of abstract and detach themselves from other stimulation uh, and, and remain in that sort of more calm, relaxed state. So that's at least the basis for this. Um, we engage in this program because there's some empirical evidence that definitely seems that, you know, SURF seems to help um, some of these patients and we're trying to understand better um, why and how. And, and look, for us, this is not just, you know, some. Um, intellectual luxury curiosity that we think, oh, it's great, let's find the mechanisms. It's whatever kind of things that we think that empirically are working, being surf, being floats, being whatever. If you understand them better, then chances are we're going to be able to perfect the tools, we're going to be able to perfect the use. And whatever help is giving right now, hopefully, we can increase that. Um, so 